is the second to the last in our series, the What's Next. And my prayer is, and it has been in this series, that all of us would take a hard look at what's next. What's next? And by that I mean, I hope all of us have really started to ask the question that I quoted from Dr. David Jeremiah. He's uh, one of the people that are really leaned for information on this series. He said this, quote, what you think about heaven will determine how you live today. How and what you think about heaven is going to be how you live today. It's interesting. I, I go all the way across the state of Texas. I was telling some people that were from different parts of the world and different states of the lower 48. And they're like, where are you from? I'm from El Paso. Oh, really? Where's that? I said, it's on the other side of Texas. And they're like, really? I said, listen, baby, when you can get the state of Texas and flip it on the left or on the right and get to the ocean, that's a big state. We live in a very big state. But the name of that conference was In the Light of Eternity. In the Light of Eternity. That is, what's next? See, for the modern church, I believe that we have missed what's next. Telling our people that there is a next. Now, last Sunday's sermon was titled, Living in Heaven. Living in Heaven. And I started with two questions that I want to review this morning. The first question, the thought I want you to think about this morning, is this. So pay attention. Do you believe that Jesus came back to life? Do you believe that he came back to life? Don't worry about the whole cross and, and redemption and this, that, and the other. The physical act. Do you, can you believe that a guy dies and raised his own life? That's really the first question you have to ask yourself. Don't worry about the other churchy stuff. The second question, do you really believe in a real place? A real physical place after your time here on earth called heaven. Now I find this incredibly odd. That the only person to have come back to life, to raise his own life, that many know who he is, but do not depend on him. They don't depend on him. But we're all in on, hey man, I want to go to heaven. Right? All I have to do is be a little bit better than the next guy to get to heaven. You see, listen to me. Eternity. That word eternity is what is in store for everyone. Making it to heaven is different. It is placing your trust in Christ, who is the only person in history to have laid down his life and bring it back up to life. In John 14, 3, Jesus said, I go. You see, this is why it's important. Jesus says, I go and I prepare a place for you. And if you haven't settled that part right there, then it will be difficult for you to even appreciate or understand today's sermon. What's next? the new heaven, and the new earth. That's what's next. Last Sunday, I told you all who were there last Sunday that it would be a two-part sermon on what's next because really there are three settings of what's next, that view of heaven. By that, what I mean when we die. But like I said last Sunday, don't worry or be concerned because the Bible is very clear. After this earth, we will be immediately with Christ and that is beautiful, amen? amen? And so heaven is the place that Christians, that those of us who have put our hope and trust in Christ, go to in heaven. Then we saw the heavenly city last Sunday. That's what we saw. And this city is in heaven right now. That is the place that Jesus says he went to prepare a place for us. And then today we will see with some detail that third place, and that is the new heaven and the new earth. That's the one that I've been getting those what ifs. Am I going to see little Bob again, my little dog up there? Well, I hope to answer that. 
And I believe that many of us have been learning and even getting some of those answers that we had for some of the concerns that we had that became even fears because of misinformation or error in Scripture. And so if you missed last Sunday's message or any of those in our sermon series or any others, I want to welcome you and challenge you to go to our YouTube channel. Just type in Mesa Place Church El Paso and you can look for those. We thank Jack Dimbicki and David Gonzalez for managing that for us. Now, we don't have a whole lot of time on Sunday morning. I know some of us are, are wanting to get out of here just as quick as possible, so I want to be sensitive to that. But, listen to me, I cannot rush through this. Because this is where lots of errors have occurred, this one section in our sermon today, in that series. This is where a lot of fears uh, were created, doubts, concerns. This one section. The first area I want us to remember from last Sunday is that at the present time, right now, if you are living here right now and listening in the audience, raise your hand. Okay, everyone's alive. That's good. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, knock them on the back of the head. They're not alive this morning. They're like, hi, Chihuahua, I didn't raise my hand. Right now, those of us that are here presently, we are officially, listen to me very closely, we are in the last days. You can write that down if you want. We are living right now in the last days the Bible speaks about. Now, before you stress out, the last days, let me explain, last days is the time Jesus said that at any moment now, he, Jesus, can come back. Those are the last days, okay? And so when, when, when he died on the cross and then came back to life, was resurrected, the clock, so to speak, started on the last days, right there. Right there, that's when it started. Why? Because, listen to me, this is the why, because he is the only one worthy enough to judge the world. Why? Because he created it. And he, Jesus, came and lived as a man, died on the cross for our sins. And so who better than Jesus? That's why the clock started running. Now, uh, many think of the last days kind of like the Terminator movies. How many of you have that vision of last days like that? I'm the only one, huh? I'm the, okay, two of us. Thank you, Papa. Thank, three, maybe. Three. Right. Four. And we would be wrong thinking that way about the last days. That's, that's wrong. Some of us live in fear about the last days. Last days of what is the better question? Last days of what? What are these last days? You see, it's the last days of the church. It's the last days of the church. You see, listen to me very carefully. The church isn't what you're at right now. Did you know that? The... The church isn't what you're at right now. You see, you are at a service gathered with some of the church. Did you know that? You are at a service gathered with some of the church. Now, listen to what I just said. I said some of the church. And that is because the church is a title. It is a characteristic. It is what we are. All of us throughout time and place I'm the church. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're the church. I should, have, I should have put my hair up like that, like a steeple today. Kind of like Nando a little bit like that today. Right? I would have been a little church. <laughs> with my little steeple. That's why I like churches with steeple. Do you know why? Because it's all those people gathered to together in that steeple saying, He is Lord. That's what steeples were made for. Did you know that? All those that believe in Jesus Christ are the church. Strong believers, weak believers, hypocritical believers. We are a family. We have been given together through, through, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are the church. You are the church. I am the church. So, so don't get lost, okay? Stay, stay with me because this is now crucial so right now, we are living in what is called the church age. You may want to write that down. We are living in the church age. In the last days that we are in, we are living in the church age. 
That is the time that the people are coming together. We're going into the gathering. We're going into the iglesia, the Greek word. The Greek word is the church. And we've seen the gathering with Christ in the book of Revelation. We will all be gathered with him. Well, I don't know about you, that hasn't happened yet. Yet. But we are living, make no mistake, in the last days, but Christ hasn't come back, you see. Now, two things real quick, right? Some are asking, well, what's taking so long? And when is it going to happen? Pastor, that was like over 2,000 years ago that he hung on the cross. Well, you see, on the Bible, check this out. The Bible says that a day for the Lord is like a 1,000 years, right? So since Christ went to heaven, it's been less than two and a half days. Think about that. And then also in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, Peter says to people back then, see, see if this sounds familiar. In 2 Peter, he says, people were telling him, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, that's, we put him in the grave, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Right? When's your Jesus coming back, people say. Second, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, John tells us this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye, except for the ones in El Paso, I know that, every eye will see him. Now, I haven't seen that happen. I, I, I didn't hear of an earth-shattering moment like that. Or, or, or people being taken up, a, a mass amount of people going simultaneously. Have any of you? No? Okay, that hasn't happened yet. So we're still in the gathering right now here on earth. We're in the church age. You see, so all those people, those of you here today, right, with those questions, right? The, you guys want to be hip and cool with the theology and stuff. Hey, pastor, does this church believe that you're in the post-trib and in the pre-trib and the, pre the post-trib are you tripping on the trib listen we are living in the church age that's what you should know we're living in the church age and when those of us who die we go to heaven with christ living in that new jerusalem that will eventually that heavenly city check that out will come down to earth you see but christ you see still hasn't gone for the gathering the church that hasn't happened then christ will reign on the earth for a thousand years then that heavenly city will come down to the earth, and then, and this is so cool, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And let me tell you something, that is awesome. And this is what we will see is some detail this morning, okay? So I hope some of you got some clarity or where we are and what are the next things that will have to occur. I heard recently that all the earth kind of missed out on the new heavenly city. We kind of missed out on the new heaven. We, we missed all that because Christ died on the cross because he messed up. I heard that. I was like, what? What are you talking about? I echo what the Apostle Paul's sentiment says about those of us that might believe that we kind of missed out, that Jesus kind of messed things up. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19, Paul says this. Now, if Christ is preached, right, that's what I'm doing. That he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That's what we're preaching. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul says, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God. If I'm standing here preaching that I'm a false witness, he says. Because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if that's what you're thinking, if in fact the dead are not raised. That is, if one person is not raised back to life, you're also discounting Christ. Did you know that? For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. That is, if Christ didn't even come back to life, you're still st stuck in your sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep, that's gone into the grave, and Christ perished. If we have hope Christ in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. I don't think we're to be pitied. 
Okay? So we die. We're in heaven. Up today, we're still living in the church age. But we still get to go to heaven. Living in that new city. Then after the thousand year reign, also known as the millennial reign, then there will be the new heaven and the new earth. And that is what we will see and focus on this morning. So what is the new heaven and the new earth? Well, first in your outline, on the first part of your outline, turn it over. The first thing that you have to know about the new heaven and the new earth is that it is a promise. The new heaven and the new earth is a promise. And, and this is where, talk about confusion, but first thing to understand is it's a promise. Isn't that great that God keeps his promise all the way to the end? Amen? And this promise is all over Scripture, and by that I mean the Old and the New Testaments. Some only believe that we're in the New Testament. Baby, it's all over. It's all over. It's like good soup. It's in there. It's all over, man. Mmm, I like me some soup. Anyway, let's look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. Can you tell the pastor's hunger? Isaiah 66, verse 22. Let's look at this promise. It says, for just as the new heavens and the new earth, Akanijo, did you see that? Right off the bat. For just as the new heavens, emphatically, and the new earth, which I will make endure before me, that's, I'm going to make this happen, declares the Lord. I like when it says declares the Lord. You know when he declares the Lord? It's like a judge shouting out, declares the Lord. Akanijo, sorry, Lord. So your offspring and your name will endure, will endure you see, it was, listen to me, always been the plan for us to live in God's creation, united with the Trinity. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? I mean, come on. I think of that last song that Michelle did with the guys up here. He loves us. In the weight of his glory, he wants us to be united with him and with his creation. We're going to see that today. Listen to this from Isaiah 65:20. Uh, you don't have to go there. He says, no longer will there be in it. I love this. Isaiah says, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but just a few days. Or an old man who does not live out his days. Did you hear that? D did you hear that? You can hear the love and the heartache of the effects of sin in our loving and caring God. He sees when our children die. No longer is that going to happen. He sees and he hurts when children pass away. When, when we don't make and have a full life. Why? Because his promise and plan is tied with the promise of the new heaven and the new earth. I also find it odd that many of us, me included to a certain point, I started paying attention. That we know that it is God's plan for a new heaven and a new earth. We all know it, by the way. We don't understand it, but we all know it. Now, I'll tell you where many, if not all of us, are aware of this plan. You all ready for this? You're all going to go like, I never knew that. When Jesus himself teaches us how to pray, you all remember? It's also known as the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. On earth. As it is in heaven. Now let me be a little bit sarcastic. Any of you seen that happen? No. But it will. It will. Hallelujah. It will. Now this is, we're talking about this earth. We're talking about this heaven, okay? Okay? We're going to see that. Not too sure? Well, even the earth knows of this promise. And Paul tells us. It, it, look at Romans 8, 21 and 22. Did you know that the earth knows more than most people around here? The very earth. Paul says that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You see, Paul's saying just as his chosen will have a glorified status, so is the earth. Verse 22 for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. So it's a promise. This place is a promise. Next about this new heaven and new earth. Second, in your outline to flip it over, is the purification. Let's look at the purification. 
and, and, and this has nothing to do with the ozone or global warming, okay? Okay? And, and, and for this, about the purification, I want to give you first some information, then some interpretation, and then some illustration, okay? We're going to see that first. I want to quickly give some information because, again, there is so much misunderstanding, misinformation, and error. And, and I want to ha help you have some clear thoughts on this. I know some of you are, are into kind of Bible studies and stuff like this, so you're welcome for this part of the sermon. So, so let me set this up a bit with some information first. Before the purification takes place, okay? Let's set this up because some of you are freaking out, right, with the last days. So before the purification takes place, before the tribulation has to take place, the church is gathered before the tribulation. Did you know that? The church will be gathered before all this. All right, you don't, you don't have to worry like, hey, pastor, are we going to have to go through that Terminator scene? No, 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 baby, we're, we're going to be in heaven. I'm going to be with hallelujah, right? So let, let, let me tell you like my sister, if you're stuck here and a bunch of people left earth, you better get on your knees because, man, it's not going to be good. So the church will be gathered, okay, before all this happens. So, so after the horsemen that you see there and after the judgment trumpets, right? For those of you in my Bible study, you'll know the whoa, whoa, whoa's. That's a rock band that's called the whoa, whoa, whoa's in Scripture. I'm just kidding. That takes about seven years, okay? So the church is gathered. You all with me? Say amen. amen. Then you're going to get into the, the, the tribulation time. That's going to take about seven years. And then second is the battle of Armageddon. Then after that third, there's the thousand-year reign on earth by Christ, also known as the millennium. And then fourth is the great white throne judgment. This is during the final rebellion of Satan cast into that lake of fire. This is the, the, the see you never again, Satan. You can start to sing that na 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 hey hey goodbye on that one. Or hit the road, Jack, however old you are. So that is some, some information, okay, and points for you to keep in mind before the purification takes place, okay? All right, you all with me? Okay, so now the purification, let me try to clear some in, some, with some interpretation. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, okay? So don't trip out, okay? Don't, don't worry about that. We're taken up, then all this stuff starts, okay? But let's look at 2 Peter for some interpretation. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Okay, did you see that? Did you all read that? See, the Lord is going to bring a purification of the earth, but you see that last part there burned up? Say amen if you see that. Okay, did you locate that? You see, in the Greek, it is the word, let me see if I can pronounce this, herothisitea, which it would read then this way. The heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be exposed. That's the way it reads. In the NIV is a little bit better, more accurate translation. It reads this way, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare, laid bare, laid bare. See, not gone away. So some of you might be asking, so what's the big deal? Whether God destroys it completely or restores it. I mean, so what? Well, you see, it is a big deal. And here I go. And again, because of misinformation and error. Okay, so you'll remember. Remember Adam and Eve, mom and dad, right? When, remember when they messed up, they sinned? Not only did humanity die and Christ came to save us and give us eternal life, the new you, right? We saw the new you. But remember, creation itself got the curse as well. Creation, the, the ground got the curse. You see, if God didn't annihilate you and me, because we're being transformed right in the new heaven, but it is still our, uh, uh, us only, only with no curse when we go to heaven, right? No sin and, and eternal perfection. Then why would God destroy the earth and allow Satan to win in that area? In the same book that Randy Alcorn wrote on heaven, John Piper says this about this. God did not create matter to throw it away. He adds, 
but it may mean that there will be such a change in it that their present condition just passes away. Passes away. Okay? So some things have to happen before the purification, and then we saw the interpretation, and I hope to have cleared that up, but check this out, and I hope to bring some clarity by illustration. Let's look at some illustration in Scripture for this. And this is going to be wild, by the way. If you like Bible study, you're going to trip out on this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. All my, my Bible study people are going, oh, this is so cool and awesome. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. So Peter, just a few verses before the one that we just saw, is making a point of the new heaven and the new earth. And guess what? He goes back to an illustration of Noah and the flood. But he's talking about the new heaven, the new earth, but he goes back in history. Look at 2 Peter 3 through 5 through 7. Peter says, For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at the time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Did you catch all that water? Water, water. Verse 7. But by his word, the present heavens and earth right now are being reserved for fire now. Care for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Okay? So water is, was the first form of purification that we see. Right? As a matter of fact, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, when they used to do a sacrifice, y'all will remember, what did they used to do? They used to clean the animals with water. That was the first purification. You see, and the fire is going to be the last purification. That's when you put the sacrifice in. But not destruction or annihilation. Did you see that? Did you see that? See, the Bible says God refines like refining gold to purify. Now, remember last Sunday I mentioned the heavenly city we live in before the new heaven, the new earth. We're going to be in that city. So say amen if you remember that. Amen. Okay. So we die. We're gathered with the church in this heavenly city, and then after the, the millennium, the heavenly city will come down to earth. You see, well, God ain't going to destroy the earth. We're here, but what about the heavenly city? Isn't that here too? Oh man, stay with me. Don't get lost. Don't get confused. This is so beautiful and awesome. Peter says, remember Noah and the flood? Only those that follow God were where, class? Inside where? The ark. See, the ark is the salvation. It is a picture of Jesus Christ. And if you are in Jesus, you are saved from death and destruction and sin and its effects. You with me? You with me? You all with me? Okay. When the judgment of fire happens, guess what? We'll be in the heavenly city, in that cube with Christ, safe and sound in that perfected ark. That's a boom shagalaga. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm the only one that's tripping out on that. Okay, so first... The new, I mean, isn't that cool? He's going to, just like the ark, and Peter says, just like that, we're going to be in that heavenly place, and we're going to be tripping out, going, look at all these pretty colors. <laughs> wow, it's cool. And the fire, I don't know, it's cool in here. We're safe, just like Noah and the ark, okay? So first, the new heaven, the new earth, it's a promise. Second, we saw the purification, and third and last, the principle of the new heaven and the new earth. What is the principle of having a new heaven and a new earth? And by that I mean principle is there. There are three specific things in the new heaven and the new earth that are completely amazing. Three principles that we can gather. The first thing is there's going to be no more sea. In the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more sea. All my naval people are like, ooh, boo. But this is, wow, you're going to trip out on this. Look at Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then John, right, he's up there. He must be tripping out on all this. He, then he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. You see that? For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. See, the old has to die to be resurrected. Remember when we saw that? And there is no longer any sea. Isn't that interesting? Throughout creation, John's tripping daisies. He's like, man, there's no more ocean. What happened to that? Now, the obvious question is why? Why is there no more sea? Well, let's look. Revelation 22, 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, 
clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. See that? There's going to be water, but it's going to be the water of life. See, sea water, it, it preserves the water. 3.5% more or less weight of the sea comes from salt. Comes from salt. I remember we had a family member. They went to Israel. They were swim, swimming there in the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has 33.7% salt. They got so sick. They got sick. They, they didn't know well, if they were having like a heart condition or, or whatever. You know what it was? They, they were in that sea too long. It penetrated them. It made their heart race and that. It, the, the sea has salt. And, and, and now this is so beautiful though. Hear the imagery. You see this water comes from the river in the capital city in the new earth where the trees will give all that amazing fruit. <clears throat> And on either side is the streets of gold. Remember, Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me, and you will thirst no more. No more salt. Not even the earth is going to have salt. So the second principle of the new earth, the second principle is no more curse. There's going to be no more sea, because he will flow the water. Second, there's going to be no more curse. No more curse. Now, we all know that, right? But this is so cool. This is so cool. Look at Genesis Chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. This heaven and earth has no more curse. This is where you see the curse. No more sin. And its inhabitants, that's us, that'll be there are sinless and holy living when we're up there. In perfect union with our mighty God. Amen? Now, look at Revelation 22, 3. So the sin is in Genesis, but let's look at Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants, that, that's us, shall serve him. No more curse in man. Awesome. But no more curse in creation. Remember, right now there's a curse on earth. How many of you have tried to plant something in your backyard and you experienced the curse? Just me, huh? Just me. Okay, a couple honest people. The rest of you, it's because you don't even, right. You can see the curse, right? Third principle, there's a restoration, listen to me, of all things. There's going to be here a fourth principle. It's a restoration of all things that are created. And if you weren't quite sure about if the earth is destroyed and all that, the restoration of all things makes the point of all things. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says this, and this is the plan. God, Nico, that's emphatic, isn't it? Talking about the new heaven and the new earth. Dude, this is the plan, he's saying. It's been the same since the beginning. He says, at the right time, he, Christ, will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on the earth. You see, no more separation. All one in the new earth. And the new heaven. You know, let me get on my soapbox for just a little bit. Like if I haven't all morning. I know we all yearn and we plead and pray for world peace. Okay, and that's cool. But this is where our hope is. You see, our hope is in Christ. And that he's going to bring the ultimate, final, and only peace that this earth will ever experience. And it will experience it. There's no doubt of that. This is why I don't kind of dig the, and, and like this whole unity, globalism stuff. You know why? It's antichrist. It's antithetical to Christ. No way will it and can it work. No way. Not here. So I work to be the best Christian, listen to me, that I can. So that people will have an opportunity to know real peace. Because it's not going to happen out here. It happens in the Holy Spirit in here, guys. Amen. Amen. See, world peace, peace in our time, afraid not. Afraid not. Now, we should work for peace, absolutely. We should work to love our neighbor, no doubt. But please, build a bridge and get over it. There ain't going to be no world peace, not here. Not until this happens. That's what Scripture says. I know peace, you see. I know peace. And his name is Jesus Christ. You see, that is the real deal. And my prayer is that maybe that you're here today 
And so you're still asking, did Jesus really come back to life? Did he? I mean, I'm here to tell you that he did. And, and you can see that God makes promises and then he keeps his promise. See, maybe you're here and somebody let you down. And you're wondering, you city? You heaven, you earth? the heck does that have to do with what I'm going through, pastor? It's that he shouts through creation and says there's a better way. And that a mom, a dad, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a needle in your arm, maybe you were burned at a church, and you're like, no more, carnal, no more, brother, that's it. I'm here to tell you, God keeps his promises. And he shouts through creation and he says, I keep my promise and I'll make my promise happen. Amen. But it starts with, did this guy come back to life? You have to answer that for yourself. That is really what I want you to take away from this message. That promise, that God will keep his promises. So let me start to wrap this up. Two things about the new heaven and the new earth that you can appreciate. The first thing is that you can appreciate the current earth that we live in, right? You can start to appreciate it. I know some of us have this view that, that it's kind of like, well, you know, God's going to make a new one anyway. I'll just toss it out the window. Man, I, I dig what you're saying, but it's all going to be glorified, and we're going to have to give an account for even that. David, pick that up for me later on. We must appreciate what God has given us. He has made us stewards of this earth. I know we get all jazzed up with the global warming and stuff like that, but hey, hey, this is his creation, and we're all going to be living here, and we're going to have to give an account. Watch out, man. Watch out. Second, we can appreciate where we're all going to be. We can start to appreciate where all we're, we're all going to be. You see, I said last Sunday that we're going to be living in a city, right? So you, the, you, you guys that don't like living in the city, I'm sorry. We're going to be living in that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem. But we can look forward to living and exploring what God's creation was truly meant to be. We can enjoy it in all its glory. Isn't that right? So we go up, but we're coming back down, baby. And what the enemy took away and destroyed, the Lord will restore. Babies. I'm not too sure about the animals. I'm sure there's going to be some animals. But I don't know about your little Bob if he'll be back. There's nothing in Scripture that tells me that your pets will be there. But all creation will be made new. I know that. Behold, old things have passed. Behold, new things have come. And Lord, how we eagerly and expectantly wait for that. A.W. Tozer, I like me Tozer, he said this. When religion has said its last word, there is little that we need other than God himself. And we'll be living with him. What you think about heaven will determine how you live today. What you think about heaven is going to determine what you think today. Maybe you're sitting here and you don't know if Christ really died for you. He did. Oh, he loves us. Oh, he loves us. He is jealous for me. Whew. It's amazing. Then the second thing is, did he really die for me? And then did he really come back to life? There's historical accounts of that happening. That he came back. He grilled fish for the dudes, man. 500 people saw him at one time. And in a barbaric, archaic way, they only counted the men. So that's like over a thousand people. Wow. That's amazing. They just, they just found a manuscript that said of a, of a lady giving her testimony of Jesus bringing their baby back to life. It's amazing. He lives. 
My God lives. Amen. So if you don't know that today, just with every head bowed and with every eye closed, if you don't know that for you, that he's really alive, and so you've neglected the other part, so you can't live with half a gospel. You can't believe that he saved you, but that you can't believe that he's not alive right now. I'm sorry, that's satanic. We believe that he's saved, but we believe he's alive, amen? amen? And so everybody just repeat after me so that no one's left out. Lord, forgive me. And help me to believe in you. Make me whole by forgiving me of my sin. I give you my life. I'm sorry I made it bad. I'm sorry I doubted you. Save me. Holy Spirit, live in me. And I give you honor. Y'all look at me. We're going to finish our series next Sunday. And I hope that you invite somebody next Sunday. Not because I'm a great speaker, but it's going to be a powerful message. What's next? What's next? So that we can sit here and, and learn and get bad. and No. Oh, there's people that are dying right out there without Jesus. People are dying anyway. We can't help that. But man, just to get one more person into this place, that's boom shagalaga. Invite somebody. What you think about heaven will determine if you invite somebody next week. All right, Pastor, that's mean. Well, baby, that's the gospel. We need to get off our ducks and start doing stuff. Invite somebody. Just invite somebody. We'll take it from there. Right? You already know I offend people by the way I dress, so don't worry about it. Amen? Amen. Lord, I pray that you would bless and guide us, that you would be with us, Holy Spirit, and guide us in all things. And for those of us that prayed that for the very first time and finally understood that you are alive, I pray that they would have the courage to come and speak to me or someone up here. And Lord, some of us are deep in anguish at the circumstances that we're living in. Divorce and shame, hostility, anger, and doubt. Help us to remember that if you have a promise for this earth, that you have a promise for me and that I can rely on that promise. But give us the courage and the strength to rely on you, not on the horoscope, not on the scripture of the day, not on a Twitter feed, but to rely on going to your word and you speaking life to us. I thank you for this day, and I thank you for each person that's here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a blessed week.